Hey, it's uh, Factor Fertility Factor Fiction. Welcome back. Um, we are going to be talking to you tonight about whether or not sperm DNA fragmentation and or condensation is helpful or useful to test for when you are trying to conceive. The background history of this is basically that they realized years ago that there is not a really strong correlation between traditional sperm tests and outcomes. We know certainly if the semen analysis parameters show significant compromises that it is harder to conceive, but no one really was able to show very clear cut numbers or margins. And for those of you that may have been at this for a long time, you'll know that the World Health Organization releases statistics and uh, based on those stats, they come up with new parameters or criteria for what they consider normal or abnormal semen analyses. So uh, that testing has drastically changed even in the short time that I've been in practice with huge differences in numbers that we see between the various uh, iterations of the World Health Organization criteria. So along came some more advanced testing which essentially looked at whether or not doing a more detailed analysis of the DNA that's in the sperm would show some differences in outcomes. And the outcomes that they're looking for are are, does it make a difference in terms of your clinical pregnancy, meaning you see a live uh, heartbeat in a fetus on ultrasound? Does it make a difference in live birth, which is sort of the, the gold standard, the halo that we're all looking for? And does it make a difference in miscarriage rates? So the DNA fragmentation testing is not covered by OHIP in Canada and in the States, I'm pretty sure it's not covered by most insurance plans, although some probably do. But it's not a very expensive test. Usually you're looking anywhere from about two to three hundred dollars depending on what technique has been used to prepare the sperm. So it's reasonable. It's certainly not cheap, but it's not sort of out of the reach of most of the clients that are coming to see us. So the test itself is analyzing under a microscope after going through a staining process whether or not there is a high or a low degree of sperm DNA fragmentation. And that means essentially that along the strip of the DNA, the double helix, like I had the picture in the ad for tonight, there are breaks or dents or chunks missing um, in that DNA sequence. So when we see that, it means that obviously there is damage to that DNA and, and the theory was maybe this leads to a higher risk of complications or failures or like I said earlier possibly miscarriages. And so people have been testing this and the question is does it actually make a difference? So the answer is it's complicated. So if you're looking at just pure fertility overall, we know that men that have infertility definitely have a higher proportion of sperm DNA fragmentation. Why is their sperm DNA fragmentation higher? Often because of habits. So things like smoking, alcohol use, drug use, all increase your sperm DNA fragmentation. Low vitamin intake can increase your sperm DNA fragmentation. High inflammatory states or inflammatory processes can lead to increased DNA fragmentation or chromatin condensation. So all of these things can be a problem that have to be dealt with and that can contribute to a greater degree of infertility. When you start looking at infertility treatments to assess whether or not the, the chrome, uh, sorry, the sperm DNA fragmentation actually affects the fertility status or the outcomes such as clinical pregnancy and live birth, it starts really getting sticky because there have been numerous studies and each of them shows a different answer and there's what a lot of what they call heterogeneity, meaning differences in how the studies conducted. Everything from the criteria that they use to consider high versus low DNA fragmentation to how how they prepared the sperm to which testing they use. So just as an example, there's one study fairly recently in the Journal of Assisted Reproduction and Genetics in 2019. It's volume 36 and it's called Sperm Chromatin Condensation Defects, but neither DNA fragmentation nor aneuploidy are an independent predictor 
of clinical pregnancy after intracytoplasmic sperm injection, that's ICSI. So in this particular study, they looked at about 132 couples, and when they analyzed them, they showed that the sperm condensation, the chromatin condensation made a difference, but the DNA fragmentation component of the testing did not. And that was using ICSI, where you're actually choosing the individual sperm and injecting it. So in that particular study, they weren't showing a big difference in terms of outcome comes for the DNA frag, but the sperm chromatin condensation actually did have quite a significant difference. When you looked at another study done uh, in the same year, in May 2019, this is a small study. It's only involving, uh, I think, 53 cycles. And this was done out of Korea. They conversely showed that if you use a very high rate of DNA fragmentation, so this is 30%, which pretty much everybody would consider quite high, that it actually decreased the clinical pregnancy rate and it actually decreased the number of top quality embryos. So they concluded that in normal responding women, so these are patients that have normal functioning ovaries, high sperm DNA fragmentation resulted in low day three embryo formation, let alone day five. It takes even more to get to day five. And so they said, our results suggest a paternal effect on embryo quality in IVF and ICSI cycles. So again, these are studies with ICSI, where even though you are choosing the sperm in this study, they're showing a higher complication rate. You're not getting the same number of embryos developing, and you're definitely not getting the same number of top quality embryos developing. So the jury is kind of out, but there's even more data, and I can kind of rhyme off a whole study here, but just, you brought guys probably won't see this real clearly, but there's like dozens and dozens of studies that have been done. So just kind of going through them. 2006, sperm DNA damage uh, decreases the chance of IVF clinical pregnancy, um, so, uh, but has no significant effect on the chance of clinical pregnancy after IVF or ICSI. When you looked at another one, they looked at pregnancy outcomes. They said the sperm chromatin structure was significantly predictive for reduced pregnancy success using IV, IUI and IVF, but less with ICSI. Um, another study lowered down the line, live birth rate in 2015 by Osman. They showed a high sperm DNA fragmentation in couples undergoing assisted reproduction techniques is associated with lower live birth rates. Now that's the, one of the few studies that actually did show a significant impact on live birth rates. What do we know for sure? What we do know from the sperm DNA fragmentation assays <clears throat> and the chromatin condensation is that it is associated with an increased risk of miscarriage. So if you are a male and you have a high sperm DNA fragmentation index, you are at a significantly higher risk of having offspring that will subsequently miscarry in the, usually in the first trimester. So of course everybody's saying, well, how high? It is staggeringly high. In a meta-analysis published in Fertility and Sterility, just a few months back in 2019, they showed that when you pooled all of the studies together, the risk was 11.9 times higher. So that's almost 1200% more than men that did not have high sperm DNA fragmentation. So we are not 100% sure about the impact of the sperm DNA fragmentation on the outcomes of clinical pregnancy and live birth rate, although there are many studies suggesting there may be an association. The overall studies are super complicated because they didn't use uniform criteria, they didn't use uniform testing, and so we really don't know. But what we do think we know is that when you're looking at miscarriage or abortion rates, the miscarriage and abortion rates are definitely higher when you are struggling with increased sperm DNA fragmentation. So what should you do? Number one, get rid of of all of the bad substances, and hopefully you guys will have lots of likes for that. All of your partners should be off of smoking, drinking, and drug use. It is the number one thing you gotta deal with. Number two, if they are obese, diabetic, insulin resistant, um, out of shape, it is really important to put them on a healthy diet 
get rid of a lot of toxic substances, high sugar levels, high cholesterol levels, high fat intake, all of that needs to be corrected. And you wanna get them in as much shape as you can because men that are obese have higher states of inflammation just as women do, and that inflammation can probably lead to increased sperm DNA fragmentation, and that has been shown in studies before as well. And then the final thing you wanna do is get them on vitamins. A lot of this stuff that we see with sperm DNA fragmentation has to do with the oxidation level in men's bodies. If you have a high level of oxidation, you end up with more sperm DNA fragmentation. How do you treat high levels of oxidation? With antioxidants. What are the most common antioxidants? Vitamins, supplements, coenzyme Q10, fish oils, all of the different things you see, zinc, magnesium, selenium, L-arginine, L-carnitine. A lot of these are all often pooled together. As many of you who work with us know, we use the YAD pharmaceutical line. Again, I always use the disclosure, I do not have any kind of financial interest with them, but they are a great vitamin company here in Canada. They're relatively inexpensive. They do a really good job and it kind of compacts all of those vitamins and supplements you need into one product or there's actually a couple of products to do it with and that can definitely help improve your sperm DNA fragmentation. So to summarize, is sperm DNA fragmentation useful for predicting clinical pregnancy or live birth rate? The answer is fact or fiction. It's neither fact nor fiction, we're not sure. Right now, it's probably becoming a fact. And for miscarriage rates, it is a fact. If you have a high sperm DNA fragmentation assay index, you are going to unfortunately be at risk for a higher risk of miscarriage. So thank you for joining us for that portion of the show. I'm gonna start taking questions now, so I have to look down at the computer, so forgive me for not keeping my attention on you guys all the time, but we will go through all this and look. So I know book. Uh, is it normal to get mild cramps when taking 200 milligrams three times daily of Prometrium? So if you're talking about uterine cramps, it's actually designed not to cause cramping. In fact, it's supposed to do the opposite. Progesterone is associated with what we call uterine quiescence, meaning it's supposed to relax the uterus. So you shouldn't be cramping. There are some people that have peanut allergies, and if you have a peanut allergy, you can be sensitive to Prometrium or any kind of nut allergy. So make sure you're not starting up kind of an allergic reaction because that would be really important for you. Um, and also make sure there, that it isn't something else when you're inserting these. Your fingers need to be clean. You are hovering around your urethra, which can um, unfortunately cause some increase in the risks of uh, problems with things like urinary tract infection. So the cramping may not be your uterus, it may actually be your bladder and you wanna make sure about that. So it shouldn't be causing any cramping. Um, you should be fine. Um, hi to everybody that's saying hi, I love you guys. Um, may have been asked but not sure. Best supplements to help sperm count and motility if there are any at all. Yeah, so um, like I said, I use the YAD pharmaceutical line. You do not have to. Any uh, pharm pharmacy can supply you with any number of individual vitamins. It's usually more expensive doing it that way, which is why we recommend using one of these sort of pre-made fertility specific vitamins. Uh, in our experience, the YAD line seems to work very well. That's YAD, Y-A-D, and the website I think is Y-A-D-Tech, T-E-C-H dot com. Um, they work really well and they're relatively inexpensive. Um, for those of you that have uh, used them and like them, again, make sure you throw out lots of likes and uh, um, you know, share with everybody else to know if you've had a good experience with those vitamins. Um, there is constantly new data evolving, so we constantly see papers saying these vitamins are good, those vitamins are not helpful. It's real difficult to do these studies because you need huge numbers to show significant differences, but it definitely does appear to have a significant impact on DNA uh, parameters. <clears throat> thank you for all you do. Our family is forever grateful to you. Oh, thank you. That's very nice of you to say. Um, how can these tests be done for someone who has had a vasectomy? Well, that's a great question. So if you've had a vasectomy, uh, the tube called the vas deferens, which connects the epididymis, which is a little sort of sac sitting on top of the testicle, um, out to the tract that's gonna flow outwards uh, and through the penis, uh, that has been blocked or cut. 
Uh, and so when that is blocked or cut, you have to do a sperm extraction procedure in order to get any kind of semen analysis. Unfortunately, because it's been in the epididymis, it does not have the same opportunity to activate and function like normal sperm. Not to mention often men have antibodies to their sperm after they've had a vasectomy. So you can't actually, under normal circumstances, do sperm DNA fragmentation testing on extracted sperm. You're also getting a lot less sperm typically. It's really difficult to get enough to make it work for those tests. So it's hard to do sperm DNA fragmentation on extracted sperm. You can do it from ejaculated sperm, but if you have to extract it from the epididymis or the testicle, it's probably gonna be really, really difficult to get uh, success there. Okay, let's go down to um, Instagram. Hi, all my Instagram friends. Uh, okay, let's get some questions here. I liked it better when you were reading these out last time. Yeah, <laughs> okay, we had two miscarriages prior to seeing you and the semen analysis was good. Is it worth to have this sperm DNA fragmentation test with you? Yeah, I think it actually is probably worth doing the sperm DNA fragmentation test because that testing is actually gonna show us if there is something that led to the miscarriages. We know for sure that there is the potential that the sperm DNA fragmentation assay may show us something related to the miscarriage risk. And if we see something there, then that's something we need to address. The bigger question is, can you have a high sperm DNA fragmentation assay and have normal sperm parameters? And the answer is you actually can, and I've seen that before. So just having a semen analysis is not enough to tell you whether or not your sperm DNA fragmentation is high or low. Now we're not gonna routine do the sperm DNA fragmentation for all our patients we are going to start doing it here because I am seeing more and more data suggesting that it is clinically useful but we're going to do it definitely for the guys that have poor sperm and for the couples where they've had increased numbers of miscarriages so if you've had two or more you meet the criteria for recurrent pregnancy loss based on the current guidelines and so yes I think you should consider having it done uh, hi there I have a question <clears throat> Today is day six of my stim and I only have two follicles that are 1.1 uh, centimeters. I have seven other follicles that are smaller. Should I be worried? My doc told me to start Orgolutran. Uh, okay, so most places will not tell you to start Orgolutran that early unless your estrogen level is high. And it does depend on the size of your seven other follicles. If they're close behind, then you shouldn't be worried. Um, although that is kind of early to be starting Orgolutran, at least in my experience. Most studies don't start until you have two follicles that are closer to sort of 13 or 14 millimeters. Um, if you're starting at 1.1, you may end up suppressing some of those smaller follicles, so that may be an issue for you. Of course, everybody's different. Every center is different. Their experience may be different than ours. So I never want to kind of step on anyone's toes um, but that's definitely not the norm or what we see in most publications if you look at the vast majority of publications they will start a GnRH antagonist like Orgolutran later into the cycle so you may end up with two really good eggs and maybe not as many of the smaller ones growing in time uh, alternatively it may work out there's no way to know until you try but we normally start a little bit later um, thank you for all the nice comments. Uh, I don't like reading those out, but uh, thank you guys. I, I love you all. Um, is it more likely a man has DNA frag if he has a very low count and low motility? Yes. So there are numerous studies that show that if you have lower sperm parameters, you will have a higher um, sperm DNA fragmentation. Um, and if the count is very low, less than 1 million, almost for sure you're going to see significant compromises. So um, that's almost a given. If you have a canceled IVF cycle and don't take the trigger shot, could it affect the next cycle of IVF if it's immediately after? Oh wow, that's cool. No one's asked us that before. Um, it could if you're trying to do it immediately after in that uh, you'll a have a fair amount of pain although that'll happen with or without trigger um, and it depends on what medications they keep you on up until that point if you spontaneously release on your own 
you're gonna potentially have cysts left over depending on how many eggs you made. If you were canceled because you weren't making enough eggs, that's probably safe and not harmful. So it does kind of depend on the scenario. I'd need a little more detail there to give you a better answer. Uh, okay, back to our friends at Facebook. Um, best vitamins to take postpartum to avoid getting sick. Um, hey Nat, how are you dear? Uh, yeah, so any daily multivitamin is good. Um, we generally recommend that our patients stay on their prenatal vitamin, in particular if they are breastfeeding. So if you are breastfeeding, just stay on your prenatal, stay on lots of vitamin D and stay on some iron because your baby is an incredibly, incredibly effective um, leech of everything that's inside you that's good. So we want that for the babies, but we also want it for you and we need to take care of both of you. So make sure you're supplementing so that even though baby is taking a lot from you, you're getting enough for yourself as well. Um, any of those vitamins are fine. So Progestia from Yad is really good. Um, Pregvite Folic 5 is a great vitamin. Any of those will work. Um, how long should I wait to try again after a second trimester loss? Okay, so first of all, I am terribly, terribly sorry for your loss. Second trimester losses are often some of the hardest ones to deal with. So my deepest sympathies, my empathy and compassion, sorry for what you're going through. Um, strictly technically speaking, once you've gone back to having a normal period, you don't need to wait any longer, but uh, probably in a situation like that, to be honest, your mental health is equally, if not more important than your biological health. So we wanna make sure that mentally, emotionally, you're feeling prepared and ready. Uh, when you feel prepared and ready, you should be fine to, to go ahead. So that's gonna be really kind of critical for you in terms of uh, making sure that everything is, is just right. Um, and everybody give a shout out to that patient who uh, undoubtedly is, is suffering now. So uh, um, if you need us, we're here for you, okay? Make sure you uh, reach out if we can help you in any way. Um, okay, we are a couple who had undetermined fertility. Okay, so unexplained. We previously did three failed IUIs but had a successful IVF on first try. We have no more healthy embryos and another round of IVF is not a realistic option for us. Would you suggest another round of IVF? Is there an increase, I think you mean IUI. Is there an increase in the likelihood of pregnancy if pregnant before, which could lead to different results with IUI? Okay, so the question is, they did, IV, they did IUI, it didn't work. They did IVF and it did work, but they can't do it again and they don't have any embryos left over. So is it worth trying it again? And I think the answer there is, yeah, absolutely. It's worth doing again. So um, IUI has modest success rates, even under the best of circumstances. So you gotta go into it understanding what you're asking for. So just to compare sort of apples to apples, if you're less than 35 and you're doing IUI with let's say pills, your chance of success per try is somewhere between about 10 to 15%. If you're doing it with injectables, you might get around 20 to 25%. And now that we're using that new microfluidic sperm sorting chamber uh, called Zymo, we're actually seeing slight increases. So there's like a five to 10% bump in those numbers based on our experience. Nevertheless, still modest. When you're doing IVF and you're less than 35, we're getting 70 to 80% success rates. So if you go into it understanding that you're looking at somewhere between a low of let's say 10 to a high of let's say 30% with IUI, it's definitely worth trying. There's no reason not to. The big question is, is it gonna harm you? And the answer is no, it's absolutely not gonna harm you. Um, is there a financial harm? It tends to be fairly minimal, especially with us. I know other centers that are in Toronto, for example, charge over double what we do, and then do those double IUIs, which are not useful. So don't do any double IUIs. It's been proven that it's useless. Um, but with us, at least it's reasonable. So, you know, if you're going somewhere that's charging you a reasonable amount, um, there's no reason not to try the IUI. And definitely, if you have been pregnant before, there's a lot of hope that you could be again, because we know that everything you need to have success is there. So there's no reason why you can't try it. Okay. Um, 
What is the top supplement you recommend for women and for men if they have unexplained infertility? Oh wow, that's a cool question. Um, so there isn't a supplement in particular that is known for being good for unexplained infertility. So we review this all the time. This is pretty much a weekly topic, but there is there are only four things that work for unexplained infertility, of which one is even arguable, but I'm definitely on one side of that argument. So we know that using pills with insemination works. So that's either Clomid or Letrozole with IUI. We know that doing injectables with insemination works. So that's doing the shots plus the intrauterine insemination. We know that IVF works. And then I'm a firm believer that surgery should be implemented for patients with unexplained infertility because you will find patients that have endometriosis, adhesion, scarring, things you didn't know about that can be repaired. Sometimes it's as simple as cervical stenosis and when you stretch the cervix open, it helps. I saw two couples today, that's exactly what I did for them. I was doing their dating ultrasounds today where we were looking at their babies for the first time on ultrasound, both successful. So there's no question that that it can be useful. Um, it does vary from surgeon to surgeon and it does require someone that's an expert and knows what they're doing. But if you've got a good surgeon, you've got a good OBGYN who can do the surgery for you, um, in those circumstances, it's reasonable. Simply taking a supplement for unexplained infertility is not gonna work. There is absolutely not a shred of evidence that that is helpful. Now there is lots of data that supplements will improve. Like I said, your sperm DNA fragmentation. Tonight's topic, we know that taking high levels of vitamin D if you're a woman can shorten the duration that it takes to get pregnant and increase your chances. So there are lots of supplements that will help you, but they are not specific to unexplained infertility. Unexplained infertility has four different choices for options that will help you and you have to choose one of those four. <clears throat> Great question though. Thank you for asking that. Um, well, what's the success rate for IVF for someone with a low AMH level as low as I think that's 0 0.3 nanograms per milliliter. Um, unfortunately, it's pretty low. So if you look at the studies, the studies say that once you go below two picomoles or 0.3 nanom uh, nanograms per milliliter, um, that the success rates are quite poor actually. It doesn't mean it can't work and I never like taking away anyone's hope. But you do have to factor in the cost. You got to analyze what percentage you're going to have genetic abnormalities. You got to calculate your miscarriage risks. So depending on your age, depending on the egg quality, depending on the sperm quality, your habits, um, your acceptance of the alternatives, which obviously are either donor egg or uh, trying a lot, which is expensive or using um, adoption as a supplementary technique, um, you know, it, it varies widely. So you need to kind of decide what's best for you. And certainly if you want to try some of the options that might be reasonable are uh, some of the supplemental medications we use like DHEA, testosterone priming, um, human growth hormone has shown some promise. Uh, last week we talked about the duo stem, which shows some promise in patients who meet the Bologna criteria for poor response of which a low AMH is one of the criteria. Um, and then as well, you can try natural cycle IVF, which we have actually had tremendous, tremendous success with, where we actually just go and get the one egg you naturally produce. Um, I just had a patient who did poorly with her stimulated IVF cycle. Um, God bless you, I'm sorry you had to go through that. And then we decided to try a natural cycle and so far she's got a beautiful embryo. So um, it does work in certain circumstances and it's an option. These are kind of broad, large discussions that you need to have with your RE and we need to go through those options with you and explain what the risks and benefits are each time. Okay, um, what would be my recommendations to a 30 year old woman who has had two previous miscarriages, one due to trisomy 18 and one with no explanation? I am asking this question in regards to IUI, at what point do you recommend IUI to a patient? I have an appointment with a fertility clinic this Friday and would just like to know what I should discuss with them as they have already asked about IUI. Oh, so that's a fantastic question. Thank you for asking that. Um, I'm gonna look at the Facegram, uh, face, Facegram, Facebook camera here, guys. Uh, that's where the question came from. 
So the answer is uh, IUI has absolutely nothing to do with your miscarriage rates. In fact, there is no evidence whatsoever it will alter the rates um, of miscarriage. So from a genetic standpoint, it does absolutely nothing. And from the standpoint of doing um, uh, or reducing, I guess, miscarriage risks if the embryo is genetically normal, it actually doesn't do anything for that either. Now, they may put you on medications which arguably may or may not help. So things like aspirin, heparin, um, intralipids, which we often use, or things like uh, um, the uh, steroids that sometimes are used and certainly progesterone. But the IUI procedure itself is not going to reduce your miscarriage risk. The only technique known to reduce miscarriage risk is doing in vitro fertilization and then using pre-implantation genetic testing. But we don't recommend that unless you are in an older age group because the younger age group also does not benefit from that. So overall, your success rates will be the same um, without the pre-implantation testing if you're younger. So hopefully that answers that question. Do not do IUI to try and mis lower your miscarriage risks. Um, if that was a fact or fiction, that would be a fiction. It does not lower your risks. Tarek, you can do another one of those stamps. Uh, um, we are a couple who had uh, undetermined infertility. We did three unsuccessful IUIs, but were successful in the first round of IVF. Oh, I think I answered that one, guys. Sorry. Um, whoops. Silly question. Is there a difference between an HSG, that's a hysterosalpingogram where we inject x-ray dye into the uterus, and a saline infusion sonohistogram where we inject fluid into the uterus and use an ultrasound? Uh, if so, do they show something different? Thanks in advance. Also, I appreciate all of your compassion and videos each week. Oh, well, thank you. Um, we appreciate you watching. So, yeah, there is a... yeah. I will. So there is a huge difference between a hysterosalpingogram and a saline infusion sonohistogram. histogram. So number one, a hysterosalpingogram uses x-ray, it does not use ultrasound, so you are getting beamed a little bit. Not shown to increase any risks of anything, but there is some x-ray exposure and that's never ideal. Number two, it's wickedly painful because most people blast in the fluid and it's cold and it hurts. So um, it is not a comfortable procedure for the vast majority of women doing it. If you're getting one done, please, please make sure that they're injecting the fluid in slowly and if they have a way of warming it, that makes a big difference. Number three, you are getting no information about the ovaries or the outside of the uterus. You are only finding out about the inside of the uterus and the fallopian tubes. So when you're doing a saline infusion Fusion sauna histogram, you're getting warmed fluid, at least with me, which drastically reduces the discomfort. You're getting a ultrasound, which does not have any radiation side effects, and you are getting a full ultrasound. So I can see your ovaries, your cervix, your tubes, your uterus, the inside of the uterus, the outside of the uterus, because we do ours with the best GE ultrasound available for women's health, which can recreate the uterus in 3D. And because you're getting that 3D image, you can really see everything you wanna see. Way less uncomfortable. To prove that it's less uncomfortable, we actually made a live video and it is on our YouTube channel at Victory Reproductive Care. You have to throw out tons and tons of likes for the amazing patient who helped us out with that. She is um, uh, sort of uh, screened out or, or fogged out so that no one can identify her. Um, but she was an absolute hero for doing that with us. Absolutely painless. She didn't complain about a thing before or after, and she's done very, very well. I'm not gonna say it's never painful. There are some people who will experience some cramping, um, especially if your tubes are blocked and we kind of clean them out. That can be a little uncomfortable, but generally speaking, way less uncomfortable than a hysterosalpingogram. Okay. I see one of my fam uh, favorite no uh, nurses has joined too, so hi, uh, my friends from Nahal. Uh, what prescription, oh, sorry, what preparation goes into a frozen embryo transfer after a successful first round of IVF a year and a half ago? Oh, uh, so mainly you just need to get the lining of your uterus ready. So everybody does it differently. Some people go naturally, some people go via um, uh, stimulation medication, some people will suppress you and then do it. So there's all sorts of different ways to approach it. Uh, but the end result is you want enough estrogen 
to thicken the lining of the uterus so that it's got enough of a cushion for the embryo to implant on in. Then you want, in general, five days of progesterone exposure, so that's a full 120 hours of exposure. And then you want to implant the embryo right around then. If it's plus or minus a little bit, it does not make a big difference, uh, but you roughly want that approach to things. You do want lots of vitamins. You want lots of vitamin D in particular. No smoking, no drinking, no drug use. Keep your body mass index as low as you can within reason, somewhere as close to the normal range as possible, and definitely not too low. Keep your stress levels low. Um, some people believe in acupuncture. If it de-stresses you, it probably is helpful. So anything that will de-stress you would be definitely a good suggestion and something to consider. Um, so all of those things go into it. And then it's really kind of up to the fertility center to make sure they're doing a great embryo transfer. For those of you who have a uterus that is antiverted, meaning it's pointed up, like kind of towards your abdominal wall, embryo transfers are quite easy. For those of you who have a uterus that's flipped over upside down, that's retroverted, retroflexed, embryo transfers are very difficult. You cannot see well on a transabdominal ultrasound and very few places know how to do them transvaginally. I'm very proud to say we've kind of mastered that technique, so I've been doing it for many years now with tremendous success, but not a lot of places know how to do that. A friend of mine in the States is at a center where they do it as well. Um, it's not commonplace though, you won't find a lot of places that know how to do it. Okay, <clears throat> back to our friends on Facebook. I have PCOS and periods were always all over the place. Uh, since I've been on letrozole, I have the perfect cycle like clockwork. That's great. Since it's helped a lot, is there any benefit to staying on letrozole? I'm assuming it's going to say long term. Long term, or could that have negative effect? No. So. Staying on letrozole is really important for you because I say this over and over again, it is super critical for patients with PCOS to make sure that they are ovulatory and regular. If you are irregular and you have PCOS and you are not on some kind of hormonal therapy, you are at a much, uh, much increased risk of developing endometrial cancer long-term. It's not gonna happen tomorrow. I don't wanna throw anybody into a panic, but long-term when you start hitting your late 40s, your 50s, into your 60s, you are definitely sort of increasing your risk of developing endometrial cancer. So staying on letrozole is safe. There is no harm to doing it even long-term. Um, birth control, if you're not trying to get pregnant, is also perfectly legitimate um, and also further decreases your risks of developing endometrial cancer and ovarian cancer. So it's also a uh, reasonable choice. Okay. Oh, here's someone that commented. So this is really important. Oh, I just dropped out of Facebook. What happened? Is it back in there? Yeah. Sorry about that, guys. Um, just hit the wrong button there. My apologies. So um, also my SIS didn't hurt one bit at your office. I was concerned, but it was absolutely fine. Thanks for the info. So a uh, big shout out for that post. Thank you. Um, we really try very, very hard to make sure our SIS procedures are not uncomfortable. Um, we've had many patients go other places where they say it's quite uncomfortable. It's just in how gentle you are, making sure that fluid is warm and injecting it very, very slowly. A lot of places do not do that. What is the ideal vitamin D level? Um, at least uh, 75, um, that's really important. Um, and that's uh, nanograms per mil. And if you can get even higher, that's better. Um, if you have very low vitamin D, take at least 2,000 units a day and preferably up to 4,000 units a day. Um, anywhere in there is, is a reasonable level. Okay, back to Instagram. Um, I think I'm done with the Facebook one, so if more people wanna post there, by all means. I couldn't go through with my SIS procedure due to pain and extreme discomfort. What is the next step for me? Uh, I don't know if you did that with us. If you did it with us, uh, I'm very sorry it was uncomfortable, although that's not typical. Um, try asking them to do the things that we talked about. So warm the fluid, make sure they're injecting it extremely slowly, 
um, and have them walk you through every step. I mean, a lot of it's just the anxiety of coming into an unknown procedure with unexpected results and not knowing what's gonna happen. So if you kind of get walked through it, which I always do, I tell you every step of what I'm doing, you know, now I'm gonna insert the speculum, now you're gonna feel something cold, now you're gonna feel something touch. Um, I'm inserting the catheter, like I'll legitimately walk you through it. And if you watch that video, you'll see how I do them. If you get them to mimic what I've done, it really should not be uncomfortable or painful for you. So hopefully um, that'll do wonders for you. And uh, obviously, as always, um, on any of these, you know, share, like, and comment if you find that it's better for you after you've done that, because we really want other people to be getting the same care that we provide here. Okay, <clears throat> how long do sperm live in the uterus after IUI? Should the trigger shot be given more than 24 hours in advance of the IUI procedure? Um, that's a great question. So sperm can live in your body for up to three days. Uh, so we know that they can find sperm in the cul-de-sac, which is behind your uterus after it's actually come out of your fallopian tube, three days after it was ejaculated into the vagina, and that sperm can still be alive. So I don't think anyone's ever looked at how many days after an IUI the sperm can be alive, because it would be kind of unethical and dangerous. You'd be potentially terminating a pregnancy if it had landed in the uterus at that time. Um, but we know sperm can live inside you for three days. Uh, to answer the second part of that, uh, that question, there are actually comparative studies that have looked at 24 hours of trigger, 36 hours of trigger, and 48 hours of trigger. There is a slight decrease when you go to 48, but there's actually no difference when you're doing 24 versus 36. So it doesn't matter which one you guys want, both the 24 and the 36 are reasonable to consider. Uh, and I would generally recommend that you do the 36 just because you're normally gonna ovulate around 38 to 40 hours after the shot. Um, everybody's different, of course, but that's the general timing. And so if you're doing a 36 hour, you know that the sperm is relatively fresh there waiting for the egg. So we always try and do a 36, but the odd time, <clears throat> especially for patient circumstances, you're going out of town or your partner's leaving or whatever the case is, um, we certainly can accommodate a 24 hour and it's still reasonable to do so. I'm gonna take a sip of tea because I'm losing my voice. Okay, oh, and shout out to Wendy who makes an amazing cup of Persian tea. <laughs> Thank you, my love. Okay, um, had a successful IVF in 2017. However, no frozen embryos, just completed an unsuccessful cycle with three transfers, no positive beta. Would you recommend another cycle at 37? I don't ovulate on my own. Yeah, I mean, it. I'd need to see all the numbers. So I would need to know your AMH, the number of follicles they got from you, what they did, who did it, where was the lab. Um, but there's no question that it can take a number of tries with IVF. And once you're over 37, you are starting to experience some of the complications with increased aneuploidy, meaning that the embryos are not genetically normal. And so if the embryos are not genetically normal, obviously they're not gonna work. And there's no question at 37, you could end up with a lot of embryos that are not normal. How many? Anywhere from about a minimum of 50 all the way up to about 60 to 70%. So you could just unfortunately have had the poor luck that it resulted in abnormal embryos. And so unfortunately you're not seeing success despite multiple embryo transfers. So I would need to talk Talk to you one on one and figure out whether or not it's really worth doing or not. But there's no question that, uh, sort of as a whole, um, if someone said, I'm not giving you any of the info, is it worth trying again? You have to say yay or nay. The answer would be sure. It's reasonable to try IVF more than once, um, as long as you did okay in your last cycle. So I would need at least a smidgen of information, but if you made three blastocyst embryos, there's no reason why you shouldn't be trying again. If you can afford it or you're insured for it, by all means, go for it. It's a very reasonable thing to do. Okay, I think we got some more uh, Facebook questions. How is PCOS diagnosed? Um, so PCOS is complicated because no one has agreed on exactly what the criteria are. Um, what we do know is that there are sort of biochemical components, there are clinical components, and then there are diagnostic imaging components. So 
Uh, in terms of the biological sort of parts of it, what we're looking for, or biochemical parts of it, we're looking for increased androgen levels, so that's your testosterone DHEA levels. If those are high, you may be PCOS. Um, sometimes we'll see alterations in the LH to FSH ratio where the LH is higher than the FSH and that's not supposed to be that way so that can um, skew things as well. Uh, you may not be ovulating so your progesterone levels will not go up. Uh, all of those things can contribute from a biochemical. From a clinical perspective, we're looking for the signs of hyperandrogen, hyperandrogenism. So basically, if you are looking like you're developing some male features as a woman, you may be PCOS. So hair growth, acne, central adiposity or obesity, so around your belly, kind of belly fat. Um, hair loss from your head, uh, the hair growth is hirsutism, so lip, chin, chest, belly, all of those areas, including thighs and even your arms sometimes as well. And then from a diagnostic imaging standpoint, um, you're looking for lots of small follicles that are not developing or growing and releasing at a normal rate. Um, now there are different groups that pr sort of promote specific criteria. No one yet has agreed on a standard definition. And to be honest with you, I think that it's what I like to call a spectrum disorder. So it's not just you have this, this, and this, and then you have PCOS. It's more, hey, this is the whole picture. This lends itself to a diagnosis of PCOS. And so you probably have a PCOS tendency. I don't think anyone is ever really fully PCO or not PCO. Uh, okay, I hope you had a great family day. If you have a high BMI, how much weight do you recommend losing before attempting fertility treatments. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, okay, so high BMI is a super sensitive subject. Uh, I am glad you've asked it. For all those of you that are struggling, our heart goes out to you. We wanna help you through that process. I just um, arranged for our clinic now to start having its own dietitian today, in fact, so great timing for that question. Um, and she will be here to help you and guide you through the appropriate dieting and exercise habits. Um, our naturopath does a lot of that as well, and I certainly talk to patients when I can. But it is so sensitive for patients that we really very much try and avoid that discussion, especially on the first or even your second visit. We will have it all up on our website, and very soon we're going to have a hand out which Tariq Ibrahim is working on uh, for us to put into our initial package that we give to patients. So um, there are studies that show that even a 5% weight loss can actually have a very significant impact on your fertility. But how much should you lose? It really depends on where you're starting. If your body mass index is over 40, it's actually risky for you to get pregnant. And when I say risky, I mean it's dangerous to you and it's actually dangerous to your fetus. So those are patients where we really want to get your body mass index down. If your body mass index is between 35 to 40, we'd be super happy if you can get it under 35. If you're between 30 and 35, again, if you can get it under 30, that's ideal. If you can't, normally we're perfectly happy be helping you between 30 to 35, although the success rates are lower and the complication rates are higher. So what you really ideally want to be in is a range that's sort of 22 to 26, 27, 28. In that range is ideal. Too thin as well, for those of you that struggle with your weight at the other end of the spectrum, is also complicated and, and doesn't always necessarily work. <clears throat> Um, okay, another Facebook. I started my cycle 15 months ago. Uh, sorry, 15 months after having my son. He is now 22 months. Congratulations. That's awesome. Uh, probably turning into a bit of a little terror now that they're hitting the terrible twos. And I am still nursing. When should I start letrozole again? Should I come in to see if I'm ovulating now? Um, if your cycle has come back and it's regular, and you're getting PMS symptoms, you're probably ovulating. If you're not getting the PMS symptoms, uh, then you should probably come in, although if you're still breastfeeding, your prolactin levels are high, which keeps your estrogen levels low, and if your prolactin is high and your estrogen is low, you don't really need to worry about risks, especially with PCOS or anything like that. So that's a circumstance where I'm not too worried about you um, until you stop breastfeeding. Once you've stopped breastfeeding, if you are irregular, back to basics, <clears throat> excuse me, you should go back on the letrozole or the birth control pill, depending on what you're aiming for. Okay, I think we are winding down, folks. Um, how to, oh, actually, I think we've answered everybody's questions. Cool. 
Wow, I don't think we've ever run out of questions. Okay, so like, share, comment. Uh, we desperately want you guys to make this bigger. So we want to reach out to as many people as we possibly can. We want as many people to enjoy this show as possible. It will flip flop back and forth between Mondays and Tuesdays only because I sometimes have to be on call. Next week it'll be on Monday. It's Tuesday again? Oh, it's on Tuesday again. Okay, am I on call again next Monday? Oh, you're out of town. So next week Tarek Ibrahim is telling me that he will be out of town, so it will be on Tuesday again. And uh, we wanna make sure that everybody's watching. So get your friends, grab some popcorn. Um, I don't do any dance or anything like that. You won't see any TikTok, but you will get loads of information. Um, I think there's another uh, question, so let me ask, answer that really question, uh, really quickly. Can long-term use of oral contraceptives thin the uterine lining? Would this lead to shorter, lighter period? Uh, it shouldn't. So long-term use of oral contraceptives should not lead to a thinner lining. I'm not aware of any evidence that suggests that it does. So you should be fine in that regard. You can get suppression of your hypothalamic pituitary access from long-term uh, oral contraceptive use, and that might lead to less estrogen production, which can then thin your lining. Um, but that should go back to normal after you've been off of it for a while, and it's easily correctable by adding in some estrogen. So that should be correctable from a fertility standpoint. From just a normal standpoint, you don't actually need a thick or thin lining for any normal kind of circumstances where you're not trying to conceive. So hopefully that answers that part of the question. Okay guys, I think we might actually have an early night. Are there any questions from anybody else uh, for from any of the, uh, the various social media um, market sources that we're using here? No, tons of likes. Thank you guys. Make sure you share, make sure you like, lots of comments. We want lots of comments and um, subscribe to our YouTube channel. We wanna blow that one out of the park, um, out of the water and, and knock it out of the park. Um, I want to make sure that uh, everybody's watching those videos because they're really valuable, um, especially the SIS. Uh, I'm going to be posting more surgical videos for you guys as well soon. Endo, um, cystectomies, uh, uterine corrections, that kind of thing. So I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the show. I'm very open to constructive criticism. So if you have anything that you want to uh, comment on that can help make us better, wide open to that. DM me or message me tell me how we can make this show better for you I'll give you a little bit of info about um, some upcoming episodes I will be bringing on um, two kind of special guests very soon so one is our social worker who works with us in the office and she's gonna come on and talk about the journey and specifically we're gonna ask her how to navigate the two-week wait because someone asked me about that and I want to make sure that you guys get the best information possible um, so we're going to talk to her about how to deal with stress, how to deal with the anxieties, what sort of resources are available to you. Um, so really looking forward to that and I will probably have her on in the next week or two. She's amazing, a uh, real bubbly personality. She's lovely in every way. Um, and so we're going to enjoy having her on the show as a special guest like we've done before. And then pretty soon we're going to bring on some representatives from the pharma companies that supply us with the medications that we use for you guys like Serono and fairing and have them answer your questions about what uh, you know can be done to make the drugs easier to inject what sort of is on the horizon for use of those drugs um, you know what sort of success stories are they seeing and, and what do they recommend um, and that way you guys get it straight from the horse's mouth in terms of you know what they're seeing out in not just my practice but sort of a global practice so that you guys will know uh, you know what kind of information is available and what's on the horizon as far as the fertility medications are concerned. I think that'll be really useful because uh, you're getting a very lopsided version of things when you go to any fertility specialist, whereas the actual reps are responsible for delivering information to everyone. And they're also receiving information from all the different centers, so they can do a really good job of providing you guys with some valuable, valuable info you may not otherwise be able to glean. Uh, one last question. Um, do I recommend any books to read when starting a fertility journey? 
Um, that's a great question. You know what I really recommend less uh, is less books, although if they work for you, that's great. Um, but you know, there is a system we use called Organic Conceptions, and it's an online program which has a workbook. And that online program is designed to help you with the anxieties and the stresses of going through this process. The problem is you're not gonna get up-to-date information. So if you're reading a book, understand that the earliest that book was out to press was you know six or six months or maybe a year to get it ready to publish. And the information in it has to be even older than that because the guy writing it had to spend time writing it or the lady writing it had to spend time writing it or the team. So understand that you're looking at data that's like a year or two old minimum, probably two. So I'm not a real huge fan of reading books on infertility, but I am a big supporter of the mental health component of this. As all of you know, we've uh, kind of assimilated huge amounts of resources for our patients to use. And that's a big part of the process and really critical for all of the REs to address. So use organic conceptions, I love them. If you're one of my patients, I actually pay for you guys to go through it and do it. Um, you simply ask us, we give you an e-invite and then you're online and you can do it from the comfort of your home or your phone. And our uh, social worker can talk to you guys about that next time she's on because she's actually done the program and she's now working with that company because we're collaborating with them to make it better. Again, I have zero financial interest. In fact, I'm paying them. So uh, I just want to make it really good for our patients. But I think you guys would find it really useful. Okay, guys, love you all. Um, Lovenox is available in Canada, real quick uh, answer. Um, and uh, you can get it in Canada, no problem. All right, have a great night, everybody. Thank you again for watching. Uh, send us your comments, send us your likes, make sure you follow on YouTube and all the other channels. And uh, if there's anything you wanna know about, reach out to us, we are here for you at all times. Have a great night, guys, take care.